Welcome to this devotional time from First United Methodist Church in Warren. Our scripture lesson today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Hi, I'm Pam Lewis. I'm at Crescent Park today, and I'm reading from my grandfather's Bible. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemingly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, and whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. And now abide, abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. I've been fascinated by the study of genealogy since I was a child. There are always surprises, both good and bad, when you begin to dig into your family history. So I can certainly relate to this story. The Smiths were proud of their family tradition. Their ancestors had come to America on the Mayflower. Their line had included senators, pastors, Wall Street wizards. Now they decided to compile a family history, a legacy for their children. They hired a well-known author, only one problem, how to handle great uncle George, who had been executed in an electric chair. But the author said not to worry, he could handle that section of history tactfully. And when the book appeared, the family turned to the section on Uncle George. And there they read the following. George Smith occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution, was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a real shock. Our text for this day is not what it first appears. We all have seen excerpts from this beautiful piece of literature and possibly have a copy of it hung on some wall in our home. I know I do. But our text is not just a, a lovey-dovey, mushy text on falling in love and getting married. The text is really about growing up as Christians into the, the, the genuine truth of God. The Apostle Paul was working with a church that had some real issues concerning just how Christians should treat each other, regardless of their spiritual giftedness. The Apostle was writing to a church in a conflict, but one that thought they had arrived, spiritually speaking. So just what is the Apostle's advice? And just how should we grow in that truth? Love is a many splendored thing. Love is all you need. Love is a circle. Love is never having to say you're sorry. Well, the truth is, love is many 
many things. Thomas Akempis once wrote, whoever loves much does much. C.S. Lewis stated, on the whole, God's love for us is much safer subject to think about than our love for him. Now, how many of us really know what love is? Songwriters and poets have, have written about it since time began. And yet, how much do we really understand? The Apostle Paul certainly had much to say about it, and he says it to the Corinthians of all people. Now, we need to realize just how unusual this is. Corinth was one of the largest and greatest cities of ancient Greece. Its population was probably 75,000 people. It had been one of the most important cities of Greece since the 8th century BC. It was destroyed by the Romans in approximately 146 BC and rebuilt by Julius Caesar around 44. Its two harbors allowed excellent access to both Italy and Asia, making it an important stop on the valued Mediterranean trade route. It did a flourishing business in trade. It was a bustling tourist center with many people drawn to its shrines. Corinth was long before Christianity, a city of love in a worldly sense. There existed there the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, a temple dedicated to her stood on a high hill near, near the city. It was said to have been populated by thousands of temple priestesses, well, in essence, temple prostitutes, who taught that sexual love with them was the way to truth. An interesting and popular misconception of that day. It also housed the temple of Dionysius, the Greek god of intoxication, and the temple of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, enchantress, and goddess of magic. Corinth was an ungodly party town at best. Among Corinth's many visitors were large numbers of sailors who, after months at sea, found the lively Corinth a welcome beacon. When it came to worldly love, Corinth appears to have been the capital. And there's no doubt that Corinth gave love a bad name. Now, why had Paul chosen this den of iniquity of all places as the place for his comments on love? Well, I suspect because many of the people of Corinth had the wrong idea of love, just like many of us do. Paul knew Corinth well because he had preached there. Paul's words are quite simple and they're straightforward. They cut to the very heart of the matter. From his Jewish heritage, Paul would have considered love, both human and divine, the deepest possible expression of a personality. Love is an inner force impelling action, giving pleasure, awakening desire, and unswerving devotion. The commandments taught Paul that his demonstration of human emotion and action was to be first expressed to God and then to others. In his writing to the church in Corinth, he begs them to have other directed love. Paul advocates that, that our love should display a quality of permanence by describing it in verse 7, by linking four attributes. Think of this, that love protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Now, those are all important, but then he ties them all together with the word always. It is those words that we need to concentrate on. Think about it. First, love protects. Paul first tells us love always protects the other person. In his paraphrase of the Bible, Eugene Peterson writes, love puts up with all things. That's a clever way of describing how love treats the imperfections of another person. Each of us has idiosyncrasies, weaknesses, inconsistencies, and flaws in our personality. We all have done things in the past and will continue to do things in the future that others find offensive. Love protects the other person by putting up with those imperfections. Anyone who's ever dated, fallen in love, and gotten married knows there are those little things that we all do that drive our loved ones crazy. When we're dating, they thought they were cute. First married, they thought that we would grow out of them. And then in later years, we choose to put up with them. 
Do you love anyone so much that you're willing to put up with all of the annoying little things they do? Love also trusts. Paul also believes this. We often associate the word trust with religious word faith. To trust someone is to place our faith in them. If we show people that we're suspicious, they usually continue to do suspicious things. But when we show people that we trust them, it often transforms them. One day when our son Aaron was small, we were out playing on a hillside behind our house. When I heard a voice from above yelled, hey dad, catch me. And I turned around just in time to see Aaron flying through the air. He jumped off the hill straight at me. He had jumped and, and then yelled, hey dad. I caught him. We both fell to the ground. And for a moment after that, I, I could hardly talk. When I did catch uh, my breath, get my composure, I, I, I yelled at Aaron. I said, give me a good reason why you did that. And he was very calm, remarkably calm. Sure, because you're my dad. His whole assurance was based on the fact that his father was trustworthy. He believed if he threw through, flew through the air, his dad would catch him. He could live life to the hilt because he trusted me. Remember a number of years ago, a, a special preceded the Winter Olympics, and it featured blind skiers being trained to do slalom skiing, as impossible as that might sound. Paired with sighted skiers, the blind skiers were taught on the flats how to make right and left turns, and when they had mastered that, they were taken to the slalom slope where they had a sighted partner ski beside them, shouting left, right, left, right. As they obeyed their commands, they were able to navigate and negotiate the course and cross the finish line. And it was dependent solely on their sighted skier's direction. It was either complete trust in them or failure. Well, what a vivid picture of the Christian life in this world. We're, we are in reality blind about the course to take. We must rely solely on the word of the only one who is truly sighted, God himself. His word gives us the direction we need to finish the course. Who do you love so much? that you always trust them. Next, love, love always hopes for the best. But that's not a selfish hope, what it will give me. It is, it is about a hope that I have of things that I might give to others. Listen, listen to these words. Someone who realized the error of her ways. Dearest Jimmy, no words could ever express the great unhappiness I have felt since breaking our engagement. Please say you'll take me back. No one could ever take your place in my heart. So please forgive me. I love you. I love you. I love you. you yours forever, Judy. P.S. Congratulations on winning the state lottery. I am afraid that dear Judy fails to understand what true love is. And in fact, her hope was what it could do for her. Love is not conditional. And it is certainly not based upon what others can and will do for us. In fact, love is about just the opposite, what we can and will do for another. There's a story told of an actor who was playing the part of Christ in a community passion play. It's a rather big deal since it was an annual tradition in this community, embraced by the in, in entire area, attended by visitors from all over the state. As he carried the cross up the hill, a tourist began heckling, making fun of him, and shouting insults at the man playing Christ. Finally, the actor had taken all of it that he could take, and so he threw down his cross and he walked over to the tourist, punched him right in the nose. After the play was over, the director told him, I know he was a pest, but I can't condone what you did. Besides, you're playing the part of Jesus. Jesus never retaliated, so don't do anything like that again. And the man promised he wouldn't. But the very next day, the heckler was back, worse than before. Finally, the actor exploded again, walked over to him, punched him out right in front of everybody. The director said, well, that's it. I, I have to fire you. We, we just can't have you behaving this way while playing the part of Jesus. 
The actor begged, please give me one more chance. I really need this job. I can handle it if it happens again, I promise. So the director relented and gave him one more chance. Well, the next day, he was carrying the cross up the street. Sure enough, the heckler was there again, and you could tell that the actor was really trying to control himself, but it was about to get the best of him. He was clenching his fists and grinding his teeth, and finally he looked at the heckler and he said, I'll meet you after the resurrection. If we were to be honest, we'd have to admit that sometimes it's hard for those of us who profess to be Christians to behave like Christians should. Yes, we try to carry our crosses, but if someone crosses us, we tend to lose our composure and act in much the same way the rest of the world does. And yet the Bible teaches us that we are to be people who exercise love in all of our relationships with one another. Paul's words are perhaps the most compelling in all of Scripture when you think about it. Basically, he says, I want to show you the best way to take care of virtually every situation, and that is the way of love. And that means doing for, caring for, showing interest in others, and desiring the best for them. Who do you love so much that you're always expecting the best? Lastly, love always perseveres. Under difficult circumstances, I might add, when faced with a crisis, we may either react with passive resignation or with an assertive strength. The passive response accepts defeat. It seeks to place blame and laments the unfairness of life. The assertive response accepts the reality but seeks to live in joy, free from a bitter or resentful spirit. It does more than just make the best of the situation, but actually finds the joy in the moment. The surgeon stood by the bed of a young woman, her post-operative face twisted, a tiny twig of the facial nerve, the one to the muscles of her mouth had to be severed. The surgeon had followed with religious fervor the curve of her flesh to remove the tumor in her cheek, but he had to cut the little nerve. He had no choice. Her young husband is in the room. He stands on the opposite side of the bed of the young woman and asks, will my mouth always be like this? And the surgeon says to her, yeah, yes, it will, because the nerve has been cut. She nods and is silent, but the young man, her husband, smiles. I like it. It's kind of cute. Unmindful, he bends to kiss her crooked mouth, and he twists his own lips to accommodate to hers, to show her that their kiss is still going to work. See, love is not passive resignation but persevering quality that is willing to embrace anything that comes its way. Now, who do you love even during the tragedies of life? Years ago, Irving Berlin, the great author and composer of uh, God Bless America, wrote a love song entitled Always. The first verse reads, I'll be loving you always with a love that's true always. When the things you've planned need a helping hand, I will understand always. Well, after observing the state of marriages in the entertainment industry, a friend once told Berlin that he thought he should rewrite the lyrics to be more realistic, and he suggested that the composer change the opening line to, I'll be loving you Thursday. The truth of the matter is that our God is a God of love. And to truly be in relationship with him, one must understand and accept this love and, and put it to use in one's life always. Is your love an always love or a Thursday love? Thank goodness and thank God that his love is always. And because of that, we are protected. We can trust. We can live in hope and be assured that we too will persevere. Amen.